Well, I, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Jeffrey Kahn is an entrepreneur and has over 30 years of investment experience. Mr. Kahn grew up in Southern California and holds BA and MA degrees from Brigham Young University and a PhD from the University of Utah. His business endeavors have included investing in hotels throughout Europe, Broadway musicals in the United States, and as an angel investor in many startup companies. Mr. Khan resides in Provo, Utah with his wife, Charlene. A longtime community activist, he has held many, many positions with Provo City, the Utah Valley Chamber of Commerce, Utah Valley University, the Utah Symphony, Primary Children's Hospital Foundation, and Southern Utah University. He is currently on the board of trustees for Snow College. He is also an adjunct professor here at Snow College where he teaches life and leadership GNST 1400 with the next class starting in March next year. So this is a plug for his class for all of you here. If you want to take a really great class where I promise you will get more out of it, it's, it's worth it. Take his class starting in March. It's just a second block class next semester. Jeff invests his time generously with college students and is an avid believer in the power of networking, which you will discuss today. So please welcome Mr. Jeff Kahn. Well, it's an honor for me to be here today, and I hope you will allow me to sit. I recently had some back surgery, so I can't stand for uh, as long a period as I'm going to be speaking um, today. But I, I thought I'd do a couple of things. Um, before we get started into my topic um, today. Um, one of the things is uh, how many, you're, you're, you're all college students, how many of you um, occasionally need some money just by a show of hands? Okay, huh? Huh? okay, all right. Well, that's good. So I've actually got here two $50 bills, okay? And um, I'm gonna let you uh, win this money, all right? And we'll just see how well you do here. So one of the things that Russ didn't tell you about me was a um, 100 years ago, okay, um, when I was young, Okay, I, um, let's see, let me get, make sure that I've got this connected. I, um, I played bass guitar for a rock group, okay, um, for a number of years when they went out on tour, okay? A fairly famous group, and I um, want to tell you a story, and then I'm going to play one of their songs for you, and the first person by a raise of hands who can tell me who the group is, I'll give you the first $50, okay? So <clears throat> this is, um, we were appearing at Lagoon, okay? And on our way to Lagoon, we were um, asked to go into, be interviewed at a radio station. And so we went there, and a young lady who was a receptionist was gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous, very much like this young lady with the red hair right here, okay? She, uh, she was gorgeous, and we were all flirting with her, if you can imagine, all right? So now we go and we perform at Lagoon, and we are now on our way um, back to the airport. Now, back then, there was no um, I-15. You had to take 89, all right? And from the time that we left to the time that we got to the airport was about 45 minutes. And I was sitting in the back of a limousine 
with the leader of this group, and he was doodling. And I asked him what he was doing, and he said, oh, I'm just writing um, some music and lyrics to a song that's gone through my head, okay? And, and that was the end of it. Now, it took about 45 minutes for him to finish this song. And um, why is this not working for me? Hang on. Oh, it is working. Okay, got it. Okay, so I'm going to uh, play this song. First person uh, to raise their hand, uh, I'll give them the $50. You ready? Here it comes. It's the Beach Boys. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Brian Wilson wrote that in 45 minutes. He was a musical genius. Okay. Okay. So that's the first 50. You ready for the second 50? Now this might be a little harder. Okay. Here's the backstory. Here's the backstory. A few years ago, um, my granddaughter, who is now married, but at the time she was in high school, and she called me <clears throat> and she said, Grandpa, I've got us tickets to go to um, a rock concert in Salt Lake. And I, her name's Mallory. And I said, Mallory, wouldn't you much rather go with one of your high school friends than your old, decrepit grandpa? And she said, no, no, I like it when we go, because if you know the music, you'll get into the music, and you'll get up, and you'll dance, and you'll move around. And I said, that doesn't embarrass you, because most high school kids would be embarrassed by that. She said, no, no, I love it. OK. So I had had this idea brewing in the back of my head for quite a while. But I wasn't exactly sure how to get it done. So there are three groups. The first group I know you know well, Imagine Dragons, OK? That was the first group. And I thought their sound was OK. But remember, playing with the Beach Boys, I'm always looking for a different sound. And Imagine Dragons didn't do it for me. Second group, I don't even remember who they were, okay? The third group, I really liked their sound because it was unusual. I hadn't heard anything quite like it. And during their set, they talked about the fact that they were about to go on their first international tour, okay? Well, <clears throat> that kind of got my idea germinating. And so I have enough contacts in the entertainment um, world so that I was able to get backstage and talk to them. And I said, you're going on your first tour, is that right? Yes. Well, I said, do you have anybody that when you go on tour, that if you need a jumbotron, that they put that up for you um, if you're going to be selling um, T-shirts or um, hats with your name on it, they didn't have anybody that does that. And they said no. And I said, well, would you be interested in that? And they said, well, if it doesn't take too much gross um, revenue out of our pocket, yeah. Okay. So we did not go... My partners and I did not go on that first tour, but we now represent them when they are on tour. So let me play this song for you. Make sure we're still connected here. And we are. Okay, are you ready? Okay, first one that gets it. Okay, first one that gets it. It's the 50. You ready? Here it comes. Uh, 
All right, you got it? Who is it? You got it, come up here and get a 15. Where are you going, man? All right, One Republic. So we represent them when they're on tour, and we represent many other artists, some that you might know, Shania Twain. Um, I don't know if you know Eric Church, Michael Buble. Whenever I say Michael Buble, all the girls go, oh, Michael Buble. <laughs> anyway, all right, well, that, we, we'll start, start our lecture um, that way today. Now, um, I'm going to start by, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about networking today and the importance of networking. And I'm going to tell you a number of stories, too. I hope that's okay. I have found over my years of lecturing and teaching that students remember the most when you um, intertwine stories with your lecture. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. But <clears throat> there are two quotes that I want to begin with, all right? One you know, one you may not know. Here's the first quote. Never underestimate the value of real human interaction. That's the first quote. The second quote I want you to finish for me. I'll start it you finish it. It's not what you know, it's who you know, all right? And that is probably more important today than it ever has been. Now, <clears throat> social networking, a big thing, but I'm not going to talk about that. You probably know more about social networking than I do anyway. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to talk about some different things as far as networking, okay? One of the first things I would tell you is be proactive with your networking, all right? Cultivating your network year-around is actually crucial to maintaining beneficial people, people who can help you along the way as you progress, all right? And don't just contact those people who can help you when you've been laid off from your job or when you decide that you want to look for a new position. Always maintain relationships, always with your network, okay? The better your relationships are with those people that you contact, the more inclined they will be to help you when you actually do need help, all right? People are always more willing to help when they know who you are. Well, they're not gonna know who you are unless you maintain contact with them. So you want to do that. You always want to keep track of your network. I probably have one of the most extensive networks in Utah that you can imagine. And I contact them at least, all of them, at least once a year. I have a huge contact list in my phone. And I always reach out to them just to find out how are they doing? You know, what are you up to right now? And so I do that, okay? Now, use what I call emotional labor. Emotional labor. What does that mean? It means go to events in your city. Go to events here at Snow. All right? Make yourself available. Let people see you at events, okay? Now, one of the things I'm going to tell you, and I always have, I always get pushback from students until they actually do this. 
volunteer to be on local boards without expecting anything in return. So let me start out by telling you an experience that I had a number of years ago, all right? How many of you know the name Eric Schmidt? Have you heard of that individual? Eric Schmidt, anyone? Okay, well, let me tell you. Eric Schmidt, a number of years ago, was the head of a company in Utah County, which is where I live, called Novell, all right? Software company. Now, if you ever meet Eric, don't tell him what I'm about to tell you. He was a terrible CEO. Terrible, okay? Um, but I got to know him because he and I served on a couple of volunteer boards in Provo, okay? And I got to be friends with him, and we did some social things together, his wife and my wife, um, and uh, we, we, we became friends. Well, all of a sudden, he leaves Nobel, and I lose track of him. I don't know where he's gone. And one day, out of the blue, he calls me. He goes, Jeff, this is Eric. And I said, Eric, where have you been? What have you been doing? And first thing he said to me is, what server do you use? Now, this was in the year 2005. Which server, guys, was king of the hill then? I heard somebody say it. No? Yahoo. Yahoo. Yahoo was king of the hill then. And he said to me, have you ever used Google? And I said, no. And at this time, Google was privately held, okay? It wasn't publicly traded. And he said, I want you to get on and just play around with Google. And then call me back and tell me what you think. So I did. And I said, it's okay, but I'm still a Yahoo guy. And then he told me this. He said, Google is about to go public. Okay, and he said the two young owners of Google have big plans for the company. That's all he said. And he said, if I were you, I would bet the farm on Google. And I said, well, do you know yet what share price the stock is going to go out at? And he said, yeah, it was just announced it's going to go out at $75 a share. Well, if you know anything about companies that go public, $75 is really expensive, all right? Most companies, when they go public, go out in the teens or maybe the low 20s. But $75, no. And so he said, I bet, if I were you, I bet the farm. Well, at that point, all my money was tied up in other investments, and I didn't have any money to really invest, except in one area. I had a home equity line on my house, and it was a very large home equity line. So I did something that I've always done, and um, do we have any, besides uh, Russ, do we have any married people in the con? You, anybody else? You're married. Okay. So um, this, is, this advice is for you. But it's also advice for all of the guys who are single who will get married. Okay. This young lady, she's not going to stay single very long right here. <laughs> okay. I know she isn't. Anyway. Um, I went and I talked to my wife about it. I told her everything about it. And here's what I've learned, guys, over the years. When I follow what my wife says, things work out really well for me. When I don't follow them, I usually end up in a failure 
situation. So I, I went to my wife, her name is Charlene, and I said, Char, told her what was going on, and she said, well, isn't this awfully dangerous? Because she knew that Yahoo was king of the hill at that time. And I said, yeah, it's very risky. And she said, well, what happens if we lose all that money? Now, you don't know me well enough to know my sense of humor, but it's a little weird, okay? <laughs> and I said to her, well, we might have to live in our car for a couple of years, but that would be the worst thing that would happen. And she did back then what she, what she does today when I make a comment like that. She rolled her eyes at me. But she said, you know, this is kind of interesting. Um, I support that. Go ahead. And so I did. I borrowed everything that I could from my home equity line. And on the day Google went public, I didn't get it at $75 a share. I got it at $78 a share. And it made me just about an instant millionaire, OK? Just investing in that one stock. All right, that's the power of the stock market. But it would have never happened had I not been friends with Eric Schmidt. Have I not had I not volunteered to be on a board without expecting any compensation? So I encourage you to look for boards to serve on. Now, young people push back and they'll say. Well, who would want me on a board? I'm, I'm just young. They do want you. Trust me. Do you know why they want you? For two reasons. You guys have energy that somebody my age doesn't have anymore. Okay? I mean, I like to think of myself as having energy, but nothing like you guys do. The other thing is, typically young people are filled with ideas. Okay? I am not an idea person. I could sit here all day long and never come up with a good usable idea. Now, when I hear a good idea and I do the research, then that's a different story. But you guys, your heads are full of ideas. And that's what volunteer boards are looking for, okay? They're looking for. Now, let me give you an example of something that I recently invested in, okay? I'm a venture capitalist. Young man came to me and he said, I have a product that I have developed and I would like, I need $200,000. Would you be interested in investing in it? I asked him what it was. It, to me, sounded like the stupidest idea I had ever heard in my life, okay? How many of you know what a, I, I'm pretty sure all the ladies in the room will know, how many of you know what a charcuterie board is? You know what a charcuterie board is? Okay, all right. His idea was a charcuterie board for pets, for pets, okay? I thought, that's ridiculous, until I did research, and what do you think I found out? That people today treat their pets like they're their, their children, okay? So what is this thing made out of? It's made out of balsa wood, and then you just take the pet food, whatever it is, and you put it in a nice display on the charcuterie board, okay? The margins on this thing are 40%. 40%. It's made out of balsa wood, okay? I made my 200,000 back in about two months, okay? Two months. Great idea. I would have never thought of it at all. But, you know, sometimes some of the weirdest ideas you can make a lot of money with, all right? A lot of money with. Okay, so that's one thing, emotional labor, okay? Now, another thing about a network that is important 
Let's see. What about 15 minutes? 15? Ooh, I got to move then. Okay. So let me tell you. Um, one of the things that you need to do is you need to find a mentor, all right? You absolutely need to find a mentor. Now, I'm, I'm just going to offer my services to you. If any of you are looking for a mentor and you contact me, Russ knows how to get in touch with me, I would be more than happy to mentor you, more than happy. But let me tell you about um, an individual who I mentored, okay? And then tell you about someone who mentored me. Um, I, uh, uh, Russ told you I teach this class at UVU. And um, a young lady came up to me, her name is Trisha. And she asked if she could be my, if I would mentor her. And I said, yeah, very beautiful girl, a student, okay? Um, good sense of humor. And she called me one day and she said, I've got this product. Um, could I take you to lunch and demonstrate it for you? And I said, sure. So we went to lunch and she had great sense of humor. And here was what she asked me. She said, have you ever used a public restroom? And I said, yeah, of course I used a public restroom. And she said, you know that um, metal container that's on the wall over the toilet that has um, um, toilet seat covers in it, the paper ones? She said, I don't like putting those on the toilet seat because um, they always move around and my rear end gets to be on the toilet seat. I don't really like that at all. So. Here's what she had done. She had taken one of those toilet seat covers and she put stick them on the bottom of it. So when it lay on the, um, the uh, toilet seat, it wouldn't move. Well, then she had to figure out a way to get it into the bowl. And so she, what she had invented was a biodegradable weight that was heavy enough to pull that cover into the toilet bowl, okay? And it would then dissolve in the water. Well, she said, I need two things from you, Jeff. She said, can you get me to a patent attorney so I can get this patented? And I said, yeah, I know a patent attorney. So I got her to the patent attorney he charged her $2,500 for the patent, which she paid. Then she said, do you know anybody that might be interested in uh, marketing this? And I said, yeah. I said, I have a, a close friend who's a top executive at Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, I will introduce you to him. So I did. And guess what? They paid her, now she was a student at UVU, $3.1 million. I still manage that money, but you've never seen the product. Do you know why you've never seen it? Because that's not what they paid her for. Do you know what they paid her for? They paid her for the patent so that no one else could develop the product, okay? $3.1 million. Would you like that? $3.1 million? Yeah, okay. That's something, that's an entrepreneur for you. Now, let me tell you one last story in my, that happened to me. I started my entrepreneurial efforts when I was 30 years old. I'm going to be 80 next month, okay? I know I don't look at, uh, Russ says I look at all the time, but I, I, I don't believe that. Anyway, um, so 
How many of you know the name Lee Iacocca? Have you heard of him? Okay. If you haven't heard of him, how many of you saw the movie Ford versus Ferrari? Did you see that movie? All right. If you remember, Lee Iacocca, a real life person, was portrayed in that movie. Well, I had followed Iacocca's career, okay? He was first at Ford, did a, it was huge at Ford. And then he went over to Chrysler and kept them out of bankruptcy. Well, I followed him and I always wanted to meet him. And my mother, bless her heart, said, if you ever see somebody that you want to meet, don't be afraid to go up and introduce yourself. So I knew, I never met him, but I knew what he looked like. And I also knew, I was in Southern California, that he had a home in Detroit, but he also had a, a, a winter home in Southern California. But I didn't know where it was. So I'm, I, I started this, this business and it wasn't going very well. And I thought, maybe I made a mistake. I was planning to be a university professor. And then I kind of changed out of that. And so I'm discouraged. I'm walking down the beach, looking at the sand. All of a sudden, I look up, and who should I see sitting in the sand in front of me? Lee Iapoka. I went over to him, and I said, excuse me, could I sit down and just talk to you for a few minutes? He said, sure, really nice guy. So I sat down and told him about all my problems. And he said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. He said, other than your family, can you give me just one example of when you have provided service to anyone outside your family? Anyone. And I thought for a minute and I said, Honestly, I can't think of any time other than my family when I've provided service to anyone. He said, oh, interesting. And then he said, I want to ask you one other question, which this question I thought was really weird. He said, what faith are you? And I said, well, I grew up in a Jewish home, but a few years ago, I converted, back then you could say it, I converted to Mormonism. And he said, well, I don't know very much about your religion, but he said, what I've heard about you or about your faith is that you pride yourself on giving service to others. Is that true? I had no idea, but I didn't want to appear stupid. So I said, yes, that's true, <laughs> okay? And so he said, I'd like to give you some advice. Here's the advice that he gave me. This is an exact quote. He said, I don't want you to neglect your business or any future businesses that you get involved in. But if you will get outside yourself and start giving service to other people without expecting anything in return, I promise you that there will not be enough hours in the day to count your profits, P-R-O-F-I-T-S. And Iacocca became a mentor of mine until he passed away a few years ago. But I've tried to follow that advice and I've never really worried about money ever since I followed that advice, okay? I spend most of my time, I have people that run my businesses for me. I spend most of my time with people like you, your age, providing service where I can and helping out where I can. And that's my commitment to you that I will help you any way that I possibly can. How much time do we have left? Any time? No, about five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So, let me say one other thing. I have a pet peeve, okay? And the pet peeve is this. I hate it when I hear students use a particular word 
because they use it as a filler. They always use it incorrectly. Do you know what that word is? It starts with an L. Like. Like. Can't stand that. Like. Uh, uh. Um, <laughs> I can't stand that, all right? And I won't hire people to work for me that use that word incorrectly. It drives me nuts, okay? So, um, what I'm telling you is work on your communication skills, all right? Learn to communicate, okay? Learn to communicate and use good grammar. Use good grammar. That is really, really important. The last thing that I want to say, and I'll give you an example. Um, Russ told you that my partners and I own hotels in, in Europe, in France, Germany, and Italy, okay? Among other things. And um, I had a young woman come to me one time um, asking for a job to work in one of our hotels. And she did something I've never seen done before by any applicant that wanted a job. She had actually gone over to Europe, to Italy, and had gone through our hotel there and had found out everything that was wrong that we were doing incorrectly. And she came back, and in the, in the interview, she told me and my partners everything that was not only going wrong, but she had solutions to all of those problems. Do you think I hired her? On the spot. And she now um, is a senior vice president with us, okay? Look for ways to solve problems. That is really, really critical, okay? And the last thing I would say is look for internships. I do internships every year for young people, okay? We do internships in Europe. We do them if you want to travel around with one of our vocal groups. You can be a roadie. We do that. You can work. I, we own gyms. We own scrapbook stores. We would give you an internship. It's not my, own, my only decision. I have to include my partners. But if you're looking for an internship and they're all paid, except for the ones in Europe, and the ones in Europe are not paid because we send you over. We pay for your expenses over and back, and we pay for your living expenses while you're there. So we don't give you a salary for that. Okay, it's been a pleasure to be with you today, and if any of you want to stay and ask questions, I'd be glad to answer them. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.